So, Prince Harry is getting married to an actress named Meghan Markle. And British and American media have been all over this story, selling it from various angles. Someone of part African-American heritage is marrying into the royal family. Oh my. You have the BBC running piece after piece on its website. How will Meghan get citizenship? What's special about Meghan's engagement ring? Couple set for first royal visit, and so on and so forth. A lot of people love the royals and all the pomp and circumstance that surrounds them. A royal wedding or a birth, not only a massive photo op, but a story which can be pushed and repackaged and teased as the days and weeks roll on. Well, I've got nothing against young Harry or Miss Markle. They seem like nice enough people to me. We know what we're going to get from our mainstream media, not just the BBC, and foreign media also. Jump all over this. Remember William and Kate's wedding from a few years back? Millions of people around the world watching the fairy tale unfold. That's the lens through which many see this, and much of the media feed into this cartoonish portrayal, the fairy tale. For all members of the royal family, image is very, very important. It has to be crafted masterfully. They have to be held in such a regard by the public, so as they are seen as a central representation of what it means to be British. But in truth, it's a fantasy, of course, maintained by the establishment for political purposes. We can point to the financial reality of keeping an institution like the monarchy afloat. I'll link to a report below which puts the annual cost of the monarchy at £345 million. The official cost is a little more than £76 million. So there's a bit of a discrepancy there, isn't there? But as the report points out, secrecy and obfuscation make it difficult to compile the numbers and get a handle on what's going on financially. Bottom line is, we, the taxpayers, are footing the bill to keep one family elevated in the lap of luxury. However, what's of greater importance than this, the financial aspect I mean, is the political reality of the crown, not just what it represents, but the power it gives to the political elite in this country. Now, what it represents is unjustifiable privilege, an unelected hereditary head of state, a dynastic order. It's not merely undemocratic, it's an affront to democracy. You can't say you're a supporter of government to the people, by the people, for the people, and also be a supporter of the monarchy. Not if you have an historical understanding of what it represents, anyway. But tradition, but you're being unpatriotic, but tourist attraction, but the Queen has no real power. The usual sort of stuff trotted out by apologetics. Okay, a fundamental question is, should we have an elected head of state? Do we deserve this? An accountable removable head of state. Think on that. 
There's no question that the royals benefit from our undemocratic, unwritten constitution, uncodified. The crown is at the heart of this system. Messy. Unnecessarily messy. The crown in parliament principle, by which parliament can pass any law it likes. No court can overrule the legislation of parliament, and parliament always has the power to strike down any law passed in a previous parliament. So we don't have a written constitution or an unassailable bill of rights here in the UK. A dictatorship using the crown in parliament principle is a legal possibility. This arrangement including the royal prerogative which the Prime Minister holds, is dangerous. It makes for a system which lacks much-needed checks and balances on power, which perhaps some other countries enjoy and might take for granted. Yeah, a serious nationwide debate on the abolition of the monarchy would, I hope, at the least enlighten a few people, maybe a few million people, who might not have spent much time thinking about this subject. I would further like to think it could up the number of Republicans in Britain and shift things in a more progressive direction.